Hello everyone and welcome to today's free public webinar with TPC training entitled Boiler Operation Maintenance and Safety. We're going to learn the basics today of how a boiler works together. Uh, so today we have our esteemed expert Gary Xavier, one of our expert instructors with over 50 years of experience in the HVAC field and 30 years of that experience in the field working on HVAC systems. We're going to be learning from Gary today, uh, his latest greatest uh, basics all about how boilers work. So you'll be joined uh, by Gary in his studio there you see with a bunch of great equipment he's going to be talking to you here on video. So if you can't see Gary make sure and can't see me talking right now, make sure you arrange your screens to ensure that you can see who's talking and also see our slide presentation that says boiler operation maintenance and safety. Uh, to get us started as your host today, I'm going to let everyone know just make sure there's a couple things out of the way first about logistics housekeeping that kind of thing first and foremost this session is being recorded so that means this recording will be available for free viewing on our website uh, within about two business days of this session so for those of you who have colleagues or know of anyone who has missed this session you will be able to uh, watch this session back uh, within about two business days of today's date also, this session is live right now in the moment. So that means for those of you tuning in today, thank you for coming here and welcome. And also you are free to interact with us through the Q&A line. So we got some people starting to chatter in the chat line. Be careful about using the chat line. Um, we're really gonna be able to only answer your questions from that Q&A box when we can organize them ourselves and we can start getting common themes to questions. We got a lot of you here. So we look forward to hearing your questions and we'll try to take those questions about 15 minutes uh, before the end of the hour. So we'll have an hour together, about, about 45 minutes of the, the session here on boilers, and then we'll try to take your questions for about 15. Before I uh, give it away to Gary, I'm going to start us off with a little poll session, uh, polling you and asking a quick couple questions for you to learn about who's here and some of the audience who's here. So what you're going to see popping up on your screen is a series of three questions. And those should be showing up, popping up on your screen right now. And to answer these questions, uh, just just reflect about how um, you would answer these questions in your facility. Um, and you can basically click your mouse on any one of the questions to answer your answer for the question. And then at the end, you can submit the poll and those will come to us. And I'm going to share those results with you all here. So question one is, what types of boilers do you have in your facility right now? Do you have steam boilers making steam? Do you have water boilers? Do you have both? Or do you, are you unsure what you have in your facilities? What are your boilers used for is our next question. Are you heating the building with these boilers? Are you using them for process or production? Or are you doing both with boilers at your facility? And our last question for you, just to know a little bit about who's here is, what is your involvement in the boiler operation right now? Are you a boiler operator? Are you occasionally working on boilers as needed? Are you a supervisor of people who work on boilers or none of the above? And we're getting a lot of great questions and, and answers coming in here. Uh, I'll give you just about five or 10 more seconds. Their answers are still flowing in really good. All right, so thank you so much for your answers. I'm going to end the poll in three, two, and one. All right, so we got some great answers and I'm gonna share those results with everyone right now. So we see far and away that steam boilers with 41% of you have steam boilers and then water boilers, uh, not, not too far behind at 26% of you, but about a quarter of you, 25% have both a steam and water boiler. So that's going to be interesting. It's a dead heat for what the, your boilers are used for. So are they heating the building? Well, 34% of you do that, where 35% of you are using it for process, where 32% of you are using it for both in your facilities. And most of you are a supervisor of people who work on boilers or some maybe some hybrid or some other type of way that you're working around boilers as a technician. So that is really great to know from you. So I'm going to stop sharing the results. It should uh, re remove itself from your screen, that little pop-up window. And what I want you all to do is prepare yourself for um, seeing this presentation. So make sure the slide is right in front of you that you can see me talking as part of this presentation. And, and once Gary starts, uh, he'll be able to, um, you'll be able to see him as well. So make sure you arrange your screen as such. And without further ado, I'm going to introduce our resident expert here, Gary Xavier. Thank you so much for being here, Gary. 
Well, thank you, Ryan, and welcome everyone. I was up next to my computer so I could see the uh, breakdown of the polls that Ryan did. I was very interested in seeing uh, whether we've got steam or water. Looks like we're going to be talking about all of the above. So welcome everyone. I'm Gary Xavier, as Ryan said, been doing this for a while, but we're going to talk today about boiler operation maintenance and safety. And safety, the way we've designed our training programs at TPC is all around safety. And that's the number one focus. We want to remember that when we're dealing with boilers. So let's talk about that. To start a boiler program, I've always thought it best if we define the word boiler. And Mr. Webster, the dictionary guy said that a boiler is a closed vessel or an arrangement of vessel and tubes with a furnace or other heat source where we make steam or hot water. And he goes on to say that it's a vessel or a kettle or a tub or a tank. Well, let's go back to that first definition, a closed vessel. What happens when you put water in a vessel, close it up and apply heat? The water expands and builds pressure. You never want to forget these are pressure vessels you're working around. Often in class, I'll ask my students, what kind of pressure do you think it takes to hurt you? Five pounds, 10 pounds, 15 pounds. And I'll hear answers anywhere from, from zero to a thousand. But the true answer is any amount of pressure can hurt you. I got sent to the hospital about 38 years ago by a half a pound of pressure when I didn't expect a half a pound of pressure. And I've never forgotten that lesson. I got burned from uh, a steam boiler that I didn't want to be making steam right at that moment, but I turned my back on it and it made steam and it got me. And I've never forgotten that, a half a pound of pressure. So don't forget, regardless of the size or pressure or temperature that you're running your boiler at, they're all pressure vessels and it's pressure that can hurt us. When we talk about boilers, it's probably best to define a few terms here first. You might not be familiar with all of these, but we talk about the fire side and the water side a lot when we talk about boilers. Boilers are a heat exchanger. We exchange heat between fire and water. So one side of the boiler is the pressure vessel, that's the water side. The other side is the, is the burner, the furnace, the firebox. There are a lot of different things we can call it, but the fire side is where we burn the fuel to heat the metal that heats the water on the water side. We also talk about boiler trim quite often. You'll hear a boiler operator mention trim. And what trim means, it's a, a general term for the controls and fittings that make a pressure vessel into a boiler. You can have a pressure vessel that's not a boiler. You can have an air compressor. You can have a water softener resin tank. Those are both pressure vessels. They're not boilers. But if you put the right trim on a, boil, on a pressure vessel, it becomes a boiler. And our number one item of boiler trim is our safety valve or relief valve. This little valve right here came off of the boiler in my house. It is the most important valve on a boiler. And sometimes relief valves or safety valves are this big and sometimes they're this big, but they are the most important item of trim that we deal with. We also have the low water cutoff two required for steam boilers, one required for water boilers, low water cutoffs, I always call the most important control on the boiler. So we have a lot of, my, a lot of items of boiler trim that we talk about. We classify our boilers by a number of different ways. We've already done a little bit of that with, with you folks when we asked, do you have a steam boiler or a water boiler? We could have asked, a dozen or more questions to further classify your boilers. So our first classification is by pressure. The pressure classification tells us whether I'm running a power boiler or a heating boiler. Our pressure classifications come from ASME International. ASME International used to be called the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, now called ASME International and they write the International Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code. And that code is used worldwide. That code defines boilers as either heating boilers 
or power boilers based on their maximum allowable working pressure or MAWP. So if your boiler is steam and it's built to withstand up to 15 pounds of steam pressure, it is called a heating boiler. In the field, they're commonly called low pressure, but the code doesn't call them that. The code calls them a heating boiler. If you're working with water and your water boiler is built to withstand up to 150 P, uh, 160 PSI or 250 degrees at or near the boiler outlet, that is called a heating boiler. Above those numbers, above 15 PSI steam or 160 PSI or 250 degree water is called a power boiler. In the field, we commonly call them high pressure, but the code doesn't say that. Power boilers are built under section one of the boiler and pressure vessel code, stamped with an S stamp, an M stamp, or an E stamp. The low pressure boilers built under section four of the code, stamped with an H stamp or an E stamp. So these boilers, all boilers, are built to the specifications of that code. I just mentioned the code symbol stamps and all boilers in the United States and pretty much the rest of the world have to have an ASME code symbol stamp on them before they're allowed to be used. Most every jurisdiction in the world requires that now. And you see here on your slide, the S stamp, which is the power boiler stamp. It is one of the five boiler stamps that ASME uses. And the S stamp again means greater than 15 PSI steam or 160 PSI water. You'll notice there's two different versions of the S stamp that I've shown here. The old one on the left and the new one on the right. The change over a year was 2012. So if your boiler was built prior to 2012, it has the old S stamp or an H stamp that you'll see in a moment. If it was built after 2013, it has the new S stamp or the new H stamp built during 2012, it could have either. That was the crossover year. The stamps mean exactly the same thing. They just changed the looks of the stamp. It was a financial decision. We don't really need to go into that here, but it was no difference in the classification, just a different look to the stamp. Power boilers in the United States and Canada are also required to have the national board stamp that you see at the lower left of the slide. That is from the National Board of Boiler and Pressure Vessel Inspectors. And along with that National Board stamp in the United States, where they have to have a National Board registration number on the boiler as well. So on a power boiler, you'll see both stamps, the S stamp and the National Board stamp. On a heating boiler, they do not require the National Board stamp on those, but there again, you have the old H stamp and the new H stamp. Those are for anything less than 15 PSI steam or up to 15 PSI steam or up to 160 PSI water. So those are the low pressure stamps as we call them. I mentioned there are five boiler stamps just for your interest. H and S are the two ones we use the most. There's also L for locomotive boilers, M for miniature boilers and E for electric boilers. ASME International uses about 30 different stamps on all sorts of equipment, but there are five for boilers. Our first classification, as we've just discussed then, is by pressure. One thing I want you to note is this, however. If your boiler has a power boiler stamp on it, an S stamp, that does not tell you what the pressure is. It just says it's over 15 PSI steam or over 160 PSI water. Your boiler might be built to 500 PSI MAWP or 1,000 PSI or 150 PSI. That's determined by the construction of the boiler. So even though they all have the same S stamp, they are built to many different pressure uh, uh, classifications. The other thing I wanna mention here is that those designations of low pressure and high pressure are often used by jurisdictions to establish licensing. That has nothing to do with the ASME, that is to do with your jurisdiction. If you look at the nameplate pictures here, you'll see the one on the left from Cleaver Brooks has no code symbol stamp on the nameplate. The one on the right from Hearst has an S stamp. The stamp is not required to be on the nameplate. So your boilers may not have a stamp on the nameplate. Some do and some don't. 
but it is required to be on the boiler shell. It has to be on the metal of the boiler. As you can see here on this Johnston boiler, it's right on the front of the boiler. There you see the ASME S stamp. You also see that it says it's maximum working pressure, MAWP, maximum allowable working pressure is 150 PSI. There's other information on there. The heating surface is 1,515 square feet, 1,515 square feet of heating surface that's metal with fire on one side and water on the other. That's what we call the heating surface. Remember, boilers are heat exchangers. It also says it has a maximum dry steam capacity of 10,300 pounds per hour. We measure steam capacity, steaming capacity, in pounds of steam we can produce per hour. Some of you may be familiar with a horsepower classification. We'll talk about that in a bit. There is a horsepower classification or designation we use as well. You can also see on this stamping that this boiler was built in 2014. So this information is very, very important. And all of you with boilers need to look at your nameplate Look at the stampings on your boilers to see what you're working with. Our next classification is by boiler type. Boilers are heat exchangers. I've said that a couple of times. We're taking heat out of the fire and putting it into the water, but fire and water don't get along well. So we put metal in between them to keep them separate. So if we have fire on the inside of the metal and water around the metal, we call that a fire tube boiler. If we have water inside the tubes and fire on the outside of the tubes, we call that a water tube boiler. And if we build a boiler out of sections of cast iron or cast aluminum with water in the sections and fire around it, we call that a sectional boiler. And then there's some classifications of each one of these types. So that's our next classification. Here's a fire tube boiler, but we have not just this fire tube firebox boiler that we see here, we also have Scotch marine fire tube boilers and vertical fire tube boilers and locomotive fire tube boilers. They all started with the old HRT, the horizontal return tube boiler. I've told my customers for years that if your boiler is square, it can be anything. It could be a fire tube, it could be a water tube, it could be a sectional. But if your boiler is round, it's almost always a fire tube. So a square boiler can be most anything. And these are just things that we have to learn about our boilers. So this is a fire tube firebox boiler. There's a vertical fire tube boiler on the left, a Scotch Marine fire tube boiler on the right. You can look inside these and you actually see tubes. Now in those tubes, in this cutaway drawing, you can see tubes, vertical on one side and horizontal on the other. But what we've got here is fire in the tubes and water in the shell around the tubes. Remember, your boiler is a heat exchanger. That's all it is. It's a heat exchanger. We can also have water tube boilers. Water tube boilers have water in the tubes and fire around the tubes. As I just said a moment ago, if you have a square boiler, it could be a fire tube, it could be a water tube, it could be a sectional. Most of our water tube boilers in industrial boilers their outward design is square. They look relatively square. They might have a rounded top, but they look relatively square, but they don't have to be. Now, with a boiler like this, we have different designs, just like we do with fire tubes where we have a vertical or a horizontal. Here we have an A-type, a D-type, an O-type, an M-type. They have called them how they look by the letter of the alphabet. An A-type, the tubes look like an A a D type, they look like a D. So it's pretty simple to figure out once you understand how these boilers are put together. Because they're water tubes, the water's in the tubes. And if you don't connect the tubes together at the ends, the water's gonna fall out. So we put a steam drum at the top and a mud drum at the bottom to catch the water. And the water circulates through the tubes, but the steam drum at the top is where we separate the steam from the water and the mud drum at the bottom is where we separate the mud, the sludge, the solids, the sediment, whatever you want to call it. We call it mud. We separate that at the bottom of the boiler. In this picture on the left, you'll see one, 
a field erected water tube boiler field erected because it was too big to ship down the highway. So they had to build it in the plant. Some of these are two stories tall. Some are 10 stories tall. The largest ones of these that I've worked on when I was out in the field were about four stories. That was a big boiler for me was about four stories, but I've seen them as an instructor. I've been in power plants that had boilers that were eight or 10 or 12 stories tall. And I've seen designs for boilers, 18 stories tall. That's a pretty big boiler. So just remember this, they're all pressure vessels. Everything we do is a pressure vessel. And I'm gonna relay something, and I don't know the pressures you folks are running your boilers at, but I'm gonna relay something that I often say in my classes, and that is this. I was more comfortable walking into a boiler room where they were running 600 pounds of pressure than I was walking into a boiler room where they were running seven pounds of pressure. And I'll tell you why. And the why is maintenance. All boilers need maintenance. And what I found as a service person over the years was that the boilers that ran at seven pounds of pressure didn't get paid attention to like the boilers that ran at 600 pounds of pressure. The ones that ran at very high pressures, they were attended around the clock by an operator or two or three and they were maintained all the time. Lower pressure boilers don't get the attention, don't get the maintenance, and in my opinion, actually become more dangerous. So just remember, they are all pressure vessels. Here are, here are some commercial water tubes where these were industrial water tubes. Here's some commercial water tubes. Commercial Meaning, meaning schools, hospitals, apartment buildings, that kind of thing, industrial meaning production, manufacturing. But these are boilers that are also water tubes, water in the tubes and fire around the tubes. And here's a couple of different brands here. There's a Bryan and a Cleaver Brook shown there. Those are called flexible tube boilers. The tubes actually will flex a little bit and they're not welded or, or uh, rolled in place like they are on the industrial boilers. They're actually put in with a compression fitting. We also have what we call steam generators. These are water tube design boilers, but they're called steam generators because the water turns to steam almost instantly when it hits. There's almost no reservoir of water here. We often refer to them as steam jennies, and we use them for things like autoclaves in hospitals and uh, uh, kitchen uh, work where we need steam for a dish machine or things like that. So these types of boilers are very, very prevalent now. Uh, Clayton and Columbia, uh, both are two manufacturers that make a number of these. And most of them are a coil type inside that vertical uh, housing, as you see it there in your, your slide, there is a coil of steel or uh, copper sometimes or cupro nickel. And as the water hits it, it flashes to steam. So these generate a very rapid amount of steam usually with a, a pretty quick startup. So they're used for steam production purposes, uh, process steam in most cases. That's another type of water tube boiler. And then we have the sectional boiler. Once again, as I said a few minutes ago, a square boiler can be anything. And a lot of square boilers are cast iron sectional boilers. I heat my house with a cast iron sectional boiler. I mean, what would a boiler guy do? Use a heat pump? Give me a break. Oh, I'm just kidding but heat pumps are great too, but they're not boilers. And sectional boilers do a good job for us. These are for heating purposes only. They're not allowed by the code to be used for high pressure or for production. These are low pressure steam or water and used for heating purposes only. They are good vessels. They do a good job for us, but they're very susceptible, very susceptible to water temperature. Cast iron can break very easily. It doesn't corrode as easily as steel, but it shatters. So we have to be very careful of water temperature with these. You can see the section there shown on the left now, that is an HB Smith section. And that big hole in the middle is where the burner would be. That's where the fire would be. And the water is in that section around the fire. So lots of different types, lots of different types of boilers that we've seen here. Here's again, Another classification, a heating boiler. I've said it a couple of times is used for heating the building. 
or a power boiler, sometimes referred to as a process boiler, but a power boiler is a higher pressure, of course, but it can be used for anything. It can be used for building heat if you want it, but it can also be used for production work. That's another classification. We classify by whether a boiler is steam or water. You folks did that as you signed on this, uh, today with Ryan. Uh, you you uh, uh, identified whether you're running steam or water or both. And one thing we didn't ask you is what are you burning? That's another classification. Whether you're burning gas or oil or coal or wood or, or biomass trash, or you have an electric boiler, that's another classification. So there's a number of different ways that we classify our boilers. And the last one is by their size. How big are your boilers? I ask this in my classes all the time when the, when the folks either show up in my classroom as we've done for years or show up on, on my uh, screen as you're doing today. I ask them, how big is your boiler? And oftentimes they say, well, I don't know. I said, well, give me an idea. Is it, is it 10 feet tall? Is it, is it two stories? Is it this big? Give me an idea. And then usually somebody say, well, it's, it's 3 million BTUs per hour. And all of a sudden I have an answer. We classify our boilers by their size, by using terms like BTUs per hour or horsepower or pounds of steam per hour. So what I've put up here on the slide for you now is a little chart of conversion factors. You can call your boiler by its size any way you'd like, but small boilers are generally referred to in BTUs per hour. For example, the boiler that heats my house is about this tall, and it says on the side of it, 48,000 BTUs per hour. While McLean put it right on the side of that boiler, 48,000 BTUs per hour. So that tells me in one hour's time, that little burner can take 48,000 BTUs, British thermal units, 48,000 BTUs of heat energy from my fuel and put it into the water that heats my house. So that's a rate of heat transfer, 48,000 BTUs per hour. But I could also say it's a 1.3 horsepower, although I never would, or we could talk about pounds of steam per hour, but mine's a water boiler, so it's not making steam. So regardless of how you know the size of your boiler, you can convert from one to the other. For example, that nameplate that we saw on the front of the Johnston boiler just a bit ago said its maximum dry steam capacity was 10,300 pounds of steam per hour. That's just about 298 horsepower. If you're a horsepower person and you think about horsepower or think in horsepower, then that's about 298 horsepower. So we can convert from one to the other. There is one thing or actually two things on this chart though that I want to explain for just a moment here. The bottom line on the chart says to go from horsepower to BTUs per hour, they give you a number. And then the bottom line says to go from horsepower to MBH, it's multiply by 33.4. Well, what, what is MBH? M means a thousand. So on your nameplate, if you see it says a number and then it says MBH or maybe MBTUH, the M means a thousand. My little boiler right at my house says 48 MBH. It doesn't say 48,000 BTUs per hour. It says 48 MBH, but I know what that means. It means 48,000 BTUs per hour. So my question is always this. In what language does M mean a thousand? I ask that in every class. And usually somebody will think about it for a moment and say, Roman numerals? Yes, Roman numerals. If you don't think we've been building boilers for a while, <laughs> we're still using Roman numerals. M means a thousand. So if you see M on a nameplate, add three zeros to the number, and that tells you your BTUs per hour. But what if you see MM on a nameplate, as we often do? If M is a thousand, what is MM? It's a thousand thousand, it's a million. So if your nameplate says 48 MMBH, it'd be a lot bigger boiler than mine but it would be 48 million BTUs per hour. So M means a thousand, MM means a million. And some of our boilers also use KBH now. 
instead of MBH, they have KBH on the nameplate. And what is K? Kilo. It means the same as M, it means a thousand. So these are things that boiler people need to know. The other thing on this chart says horsepower, convert it to pounds of steam per hour and vice versa. Well, what is a horsepower and where did that term come from? It's kind of interesting. If you go back about 275 years ago now, <laughs> almost three centuries, there was an inventor by the name of James Watt. And Mr. Watt built a number of things and he built a steam engine. He built a steam engine that was about five times as efficient as the previous ones that had been built. His was tremendously efficient. He used about 20% of the fuel for the same steam production, but he couldn't sell it. Nobody would buy it. Fuel wasn't a big thing back then. There was coal all over Scotland and they just, did, they just burned it up. So he had a hard time selling his boiler until he came up with a way to convince a brewery owner that his boiler could replace the horses that turned the wheel that ground the malt to make the brew. And what he figured out through a lot of mathematics was that his boiler could do the work of 20 horses. So he called it a 20 horsepower boiler. And that convinced the brewery owner to buy his boiler. And once that became the term used, horsepower, we've used it now for centuries. However, ASME and ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and Systems International, SI units, they've all said in the last dozen years or so that horsepower is no longer a current term. We're not going to use it anymore. We're still using it in the field, but it is not an accurate term to describe the capacity of a boiler. We use BTUs per hour or pounds of steam per hour, not horsepower anymore, but tell that to the horses. So that's what a horsepower is. Now, ASME came up with the absolute definition of a horsepower way back in 1884. And they defined it like this. If you take 34 and a half pounds of water and turn it into steam from an at 212 degrees Fahrenheit in one hour, that can do the work of one horse. And that is the actual definition of a horsepower. But again, it's no longer a reliable term. So the boiler manufacturers have stopped putting it on most of the boilers. They will use pounds of steam per hour or BTUs per hour. But in the field, we'll still talk in horsepower probably for a long, long time. Just remember this, that when we looked at that first definition of a boiler, Mr. Webster said that it's a closed vessel or an arrangement of vessel and tubes. Remember, they are pressure vessels. So no matter what they look like, no matter what they burn, no matter how big or how small they are, they are all pressure vessels and it's the pressure that can hurt us if we don't pay attention. That's what you want to remember about your boiler. When we talk about a boiler system, there's again terminology that often evades us if we haven't studied this for a while. With a steam boiler system, to get the steam out to where we need to use it, we still have, we, we first have to have water in the boiler. So we have some systems that we use here. We have the feed water system, the steam system, the fuel system, the draft system, but it all starts with water coming into the boiler. The feed water system with a high pressure steam system often starts with a deaerator or deaerator as you see here. You can call it a deaerator, deaerator, DA tank, but that is part of your makeup water system that then leads into your feed water. So we have the feed water system. Once the water's in the boiler, we have to get the steam out of the boiler. That goes out through the piping, through the valves, the fittings, the radiators, the heat exchangers. So that's our steam and condensate system. We have the fuel system to get fuel to the burner. And that includes the piping, the tanks, the valves, the controls, the burner itself. 
and then we have to have air to burn that fuel. We've got to have air. So we have a draft system. It brings air into the burner and takes the flue gases, the smoke, if you want to call it that, up the stack and out to the atmosphere. So we have subsystems that go with our boiler. With a water boiler systems system, we have subsystems as well. They're named a little differently because a water boiler is not making steam. Although remember this, the water boiler can make steam if you're not careful. So we have a makeup water system that brings water into the boiler. We don't call it feed water now, we call it makeup water. That is our raw water, our city water, our potable water coming into the boiler. We have the recirculating water system that carries the water out to heat the building. We've got water pumps, we've got zone valves perhaps, we've got radiators or heat exchangers. That's all part of your recirculating system. And then once again, we've got a fuel system to bring the fuel to the burner and up to and including the burner, and we have a draft system. So all of our boiler systems, the boiler is the main component but there's a lot of other things that go with that. We deal with all sorts of uh, auxiliary equipment. We have water softeners, we have deorators, condensate tanks, steam traps, all sorts of different things that we have to deal with in this business. So all part of the boiler trade. No matter what your boiler looks like, what I tried to show you today was just a, a little a little representation of what we talk about in our boiler classes that, that we do at TPC, because there's so many different types of boilers and styles of boilers. What we do in class is we poll the students, just like, just like Ryan did this uh, today with you folks, is we poll the students and say, what do you have? And then the class becomes about what you have. That's what we do. So I've shown you a lot of varieties here, guys. And we're used to talking about all of them. The instructors that work for TPC have all been in the boiler rooms. It's what we did before we did this. And so no matter what your boiler looks like, no matter what your fuel is, no matter how big or small your boiler is, remember the definition of a boiler. They are pressure vessels. That's what you wanna remember. You wanna remember they are pressure vessels and if you're not paying attention, as I was not paying attention 38 years ago, the pressure got me. So make sure you're paying attention to the fact that these are pressure vessels. When it comes to being safe in your boiler room, there's actually 15 things that I have written and used in my boiler classes that I say are the 15 rules for the safe operation of a boiler room. I'm gonna only show you three here because they're the three most important. Number one is, the number one cause of boiler failure is low water. There are over 2000 boiler incidents every year in the United States that cause property damage or injury or death based on boilers and pressure vessels. And the number one cause of those failures of those over 2000 incidents every year is low water condition. Low water condition is our number one cause. Never ever add water to a hot boiler if you don't know where the water level is. The National Board of Boiler Pressure Vessel, Pressure Vessel Inspectors about 15 years ago came out with a recommendation and their recommendation was this. They said every boiler room in every building that has a boiler should have a sign on the door of the boiler room that reads this, never add water to a hot boiler if you don't know where the water level is. That's a great idea. And I haven't seen a lot of people do it, but it's a great idea because the number one cause of boiler failure is low water and the number one cause of boiler explosions is adding water to a hot boiler when you don't know where the water level is. A boiler explosion is not a furnace explosion. It's not a fuel explosion. It's not gas, it's not oil. It's not sawdust or coal dust. A boiler explosion is water turning to steam so rapidly that the boiler can't hold it. And a water boiler 
can explode just as easily as a steam boiler. Because if you run your burner without water around the metal of the heat exchanger that we call a boiler, and you heat that metal and then put water on it, the water flashes the steam, expands to up to 1,600 times its size, and blows the boiler apart, and sometimes takes the building with it. So never add water to a hot boiler if you don't know where the water level is. The number one responsibility of a boiler operator is to maintain the normal operating water level of the boiler at all times, the NOWL, the normal operating water level. I've often said that I can tell if a boiler operator knows their job just by walking into the boiler room with them. If we walk into the boiler room together and the first thing that operator looks at is the pressure gauge on the boiler, that operator doesn't know their job. The first thing you always look at on a steam boiler is the gauge glass. You want to know how much water is in that boiler. And for those of you that have water boilers, you tell the water level in the boiler by sound, by listening to the boiler. It sounds different when it's low on water. So the first thing we always do when we walk into a boiler room is we either look or listen to our boiler. And I don't care if you walk through your boiler room a hundred times a day, you're just passing through. You still break stride just long enough to look and listen to that boiler and that'll help keep you safe. The number one responsibility of a boiler operator is to always maintain their normal operating water level at all times. It's our number one responsibility because our number one cause of boiler failures is low water. Now I've said boiler operators here a number of times. Let me just clarify this. No matter what your job title is, maintenance mechanic, custodial staff, building superintendent, foreman, supervisor, boiler operator, no matter what your job title is, if you have the authority or the responsibility of a boiler and you are allowed to walk into a boiler room and touch that boiler or anything in that room, that makes you a boiler operator. So when I say the number one responsibility of a boiler operator is to maintain their normal operating water level at all times, I'm talking to everybody. Everybody that showed up for this webinar today has something to do with a boiler. And if you're allowed to touch it, that makes you an operator. Remember that and remember this, respect the pressure. I never want anyone to be afraid of their boilers, but I want them to respect them, respect the pressure and that'll help keep you safe. That's what we talk about when we train boiler people. I'd like to thank everyone for taking time to spend with us today. I enjoy doing this kind of presentation. I've taught programs for TPC for 16 years. Ryan didn't mention that when he introduced me this morning, but I've been with TPC as a contract instructor for 16 years. And these are the kind of things we do. And I do it not because I have to, but because I want to. I enjoy that, but what I really like to do is try to help people stay safe. So please be safe around your boilers. We do a two day boiler program that encompasses all the things I talked about today and a lot more as well that we can do in a couple of days here. So if you're interested in that, I'd love to see you in one of my, one of my classes. So with that, I'm gonna back out here and turn it back over to Ryan. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Gary. I, I really hope you all enjoyed that uh, that crash course in boilers and how they work and, and how to be safe operating them. Now is our time for Q&A. This is your chance to interact with our expert Gary here while we have a, about 15 minutes of time, um, no, no more than 15 minutes of time anyway, to, to ask some questions. We got some great questions rolling in the Q&A line, Gary, and um, I'll, I'll pose those questions to us here. Uh, yes, absolutely what Gary said about the 
this this is just an hour right and in, in even in two days of a class you can't get everything in, in it but two days is really 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 gonna, gonna give you guys that official kind of documented training and, and i'll just address one of the uh series of questions coming in now about whether there's going to be a certificate of attendance for this webinar unfortunately no since this is a pu free public session we don't offer a certificate of completion necessarily for this public event um you would need to attend one of our official two-day classes to get those those records of achievement and attendance but yeah feel free to give us a call at this number if you have a question basically every every wednesday thursday of every uh week we have a virtual instance of our boiler class up on the schedule so feel free to um to join us on those ones so um let's see what do we have we got a great question coming in about um, converting so um is there a means gary to convert um a uh, boiler from being gas powered to being electrical powered? It wouldn't be easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it depends on the boiler. Uh, some could be, uh, but most probably not, uh, simply because of the design of the, the pressure vessel itself uh, and the design of the, the fire box or fire chamber. Uh, it would be it would be difficult to do that. Uh, it would be possible in some cases, I'm sure, but in most probably not. Excellent. Um, let's see. How about this one? Is rust, rusting, an issue with boilers? And how much of an issue is it? Wow. That's that's a, that's a topic that we actually do another whole another whole program on is water chemistry. But yes, uh, you're going to. Uh, the short answer is this: Yes, you're going to get corrosion. Mother Nature says you always get corrosion when you have three things: metal water and oxygen. And what is water? H2O, hydrogen, oxygen. So you put water in a boiler, you're going to get rust. And we can prevent, we can slow that down. We can't prevent it. We can slow it down, but we can never stop it. Now, on the other side of that equation is scale. And you may get a question on that too, Ryan. But water does two things. It scales boilers. Scale is mineral deposits. And it corrodes boilers. And we can stop the scale with something as simple as a water softener or with chemistry. But when we stop the scale, the corrosion gets worse. So then we have to protect against more corrosion. So yes, a rust is an issue. It is an issue in a copper boiler. And a lot of our smaller boilers are copper too. Uh, no, not as big a deal. But in anything that's steel or cast iron, yes, rust is going to be a, a big issue, a big issue. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gary. Now, uh, the questions are flowing in to the point where I know we won't be able to get to them all um, by the end of the hour. However, I'm going to do my best to to combine as many questions as possible here. Um, let's see. Let's go to um, a quick discussion on the benefits of using one style of boiler versus another. I know that's probably a loaded answer as well, but maybe some brief thoughts about benefits of water tube versus fire tube versus sectional boilers. And yeah. where you use one over the others. Yeah, the, again, the, the answer is kind of, uh, it depends on your situation. Um, let, me, let me just say it this way, that if your need is heating, and you're going to use hot water for that, then fire tube, water tube, sectional can all do the job. But based on the size of the system that you need and, and what you have for a fuel, what you have for uh, space as far as a boiler room goes, there's so many considerations here uh, that, yeah, one answer is not going to fit everything here, Ryan. But, but again, they all have their benefits. Um, let's see. Uh, water boilers uh, are, are actually a bit safer than, than uh, 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 sorry, water tube boilers are a bit safer than fire tube boilers uh, usually, but their water chemistry is more critical than a fire tube boiler. So a fire tube boiler can suffer from a little uh, poor maintenance and still work. A water tube boiler won't. A sectional boiler, uh, very good idea especially if you have a, a, a retrofit or renovation situation where you don't want to knock down a wall in the boiler room to get a new boiler in. You can bring a sectional boiler in in pieces and put it together. So they all have their benefits. They all have their, their pluses and minuses. Um, but I, uh, I'm going to answer this uh, 
and you might think this is facetious, but I'm going to say this. Oftentimes what ends up in your boiler room is the boiler that was sold by the best salesman. Yes. And what I mean by that is simply this, that when your buildings were designed, a design engineer specified a boiler and salespeople call on design engineers and give them specifications for their brand of boiler. And I, I, I've never been much of a salesman. I tried that once, lasted for about three weeks, I think, before they fired me. But, but the thing that I noticed when I was reading specifications for new construction was that quite often it would say, this is the specified boiler model or equal. Well, it's just easier for a contractor like myself to bid the specified model because then you don't have to prove it's an equal. I know that's a little obtuse maybe as an answer, but that's why we end up with what we get sometimes. It's just, it was a better salesperson. They sold it on the engine, sold the engineer on the idea, our boilers are the best. So that's what the engineer specified. They all will do the job, but each one has a little, little better uh, pluses and minuses, so to speak, pros and cons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can t I can feel the question real quick about the class and its schedule. Um, so the two day class for boilers that you see here, uh, th this is offered virtually on online in this very similar format you see here where but instead of just us two on video, you'll be on video too. So we can see you interact with you. And it'll be like you're sitting in the room here with Gary or one of our esteemed boiler instructors. And so this is basically every Wednesday, Thursday on a weekly clip, we're holding a boiler class for, for you to register for. Um, we're also getting people asking, are we still doing in-person classes? And the answer is yes, we are um, in certain cities uh, near you. So you'll wanna check the website, live.tpctraining.com right here to check for the location nearest to you that we're holding a class. Um, we also offer on-site training as well. And in both the public locations in the city center, or in an on-site location, we're following all the latest uh, in local safety protocols as well. Just to keep, keep in mind there. So here's a good question. Um, how do you check that hot water level? So we talk about the water level. How do you check that water level on a hot water boiler in particular? Um, those this individual works on, are, they usually check it by pressing on the air vent and awaiting the water to spray out. Is that the best way to do it? Yeah, that's, that, that's excellent. That is excellent. Um, a water boiler, for those that don't have water boilers that might still be listening, uh, a water boiler is full over the top of the boiler and the entire piping system is full of water. So there's no gauge glass to show us as you see on your steam boiler uh, where your gauge glass generally runs uh, a third to a half full. A water boiler is full over the top, but by depressing the air vent or depends on what type of air vent you have, but if you see that there's water coming out of an air vent when you when you depress it then yes you know you've got water to that level i said sound earlier and i use that all the time because if you know what your boiler should sound like when it's running properly all boilers have a have a sound they all have a sound your automobile has a sound uh, if it, if you hear something different you know something has changed maybe i've got a tire going soft or i've got a universal joint going Anyway, they all have a sound. So I use sound as my primary every time I walk in a boiler room because if the boiler and the water boiler is low on water, you'll hear the water moving. When the boiler is full, you can't hear the water moving. You might hear the pump running. You might hear the burner firing, but you don't hear the water. If there's air in with it, you'll hear the water. So that's how, that's why I use sound. That's why I always say sound. But yes, your air vents are a great idea. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, let's see. Um, Want to provide some thoughts on water treatment for a boiler and how to reduce scaling? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I know that's a, we offer a two-day specialty on-site class for that. But water chemistry is very important. I made my living for 30 years, you know, just about 30 years, a little less, 20 something, um, taking care of the water side of boilers. That's what my company did. That's what, it, it was something I started back in the 70s. And so that's what we did. And the reason we were able to make a living doing that 
was because the water destroys boilers. If you don't chemically treat it, water destroys boilers. So I spent a lot of time cleaning boilers that had not been properly chemically treated or having them retubed because the, the corrosion had eaten up the tubes, et cetera. So, so yeah, you've got to have water chemistry. It's very different for water boilers than it is for steam boilers. For water boilers, it's, 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 it's a one-time thing as long as you don't lose water. You put the chemical in. If the water doesn't come out of the boiler, chemicals in there for a few years, you drain the boiler for inspection. You fill it back up, you add more chemical. It's a very simple thing. But for a steam boiler, because you're taking on water all the time, it's a constant addition of chemicals with the water constantly, all, all the time, uh, minute by minute. So it's a very different program for each, each type of boiler, uh, steam versus water. And then water tube boilers on the steam side are treated differently than fire tube boilers on the steam side, which are treated differently than cast iron sectionals on the steam side. So you know, water chemistry is very important. In our boiler program, as Ryan knows, uh, we, we do a, a segment on water chemistry. It depends on the instructor, but uh, when I do it, it's usually a couple hours on water chemistry at the end of the second day. Um, but we also do a water chemistry seminar as well. We do that uh, on occasionally as well. So, so yeah, water chemistry is a, it's a very big deal, a very big deal. Um, Absolutely. Uh, so we got about four minutes left. And I'm going to try to answer a maybe a couple more. And then um, for any of you with further questions, that we got a high degree of curiosity out there in the world, Gary. Uh, but we can um, definitely be sure to register for one of our courses. I think we can get any of those questions answered. And you have the you have the time and space to do so. Um, definitely a lot of great curiosities and questions here. Um, I will I will go with the idea of low water cutoff. Um, so what is the latest technology? on a low water cutoff um, nowadays and in, in a, you know, a, a minute, how do they work? Um, it depends, again, on the size of your boiler and, and whether you're running water or steam. Uh, latest technology would be electronic um, versus the float type that we use for years. Um, but both are allowed under the code by the boiler and pressure vessel code. But on steam boilers, we still have to have one visual method of seeing the water level. That's not the low water cutoff, that's a gauge glass. We have to have one method of seeing the water level and then our low water cutouts can be mechanical or electronic. On water boilers, they're almost all electronic now versus mechanical. Although on the bigger water boilers, uh, some manufacturers are still recommending a mechanical and an electronic, one of each. So they can be, they can be either, but electronics, uh, are, are kind of setting the stage now uh, versus the mechanicals. Uh, to give you an idea, and I don't have a low water cutoff here in front of me, but for those of you that are not, this is steam trap, but it's the same, same mechanism here. A mechanical low water cutoff has a float like this. So there's a lot of maintenance involved. And an electronic low water cutoff eliminates that float and does it by using the water to conduct electricity. So there's different ways we can do it, but getting away from the mechanical floats has minimized some of our maintenance. And as long as the electronics are maintained properly, they work, they work very well. Uh, I think the last question I can ask you, Gary, is about the blowing down uh, from the bottom of the boiler um, from that water. Um, how often should we do that? And what is a good procedure, and again, in, in a minute, um, on how to do that? That, that it cannot be answered. Yeah. And the reason it can't be answered, Ryan, is very simple. Each boiler is going to have its own requirement based on its water chemistry, based on the type of boiler, based on the uh, makeup water uh, quantity that they're taking on, the chemicals that they're using, and the operation of the boiler. In general, uh, the bottom blowdown, commonly called the sludge blowdown or bottom blowdown, is done on high pressure steam. Depending on the boiler style, it may be once an hour, it might be once a shift, it might be once a day. On low pressure steam, it might be once a day to once every few days. On hot water, it's never. So it's a, it's a, it's, and I get that question in class all the time. And I always say the same thing. It depends on your operation. Talk to your water chemistry vendor, the person or company that's providing you with water treatment chemicals. They will make recommendations for that. And then based on that, 
they will tell you how often, how long to do this blowdown. Excellent. And, and for everyone here, thank you so much for your great questions. We're getting, a, a, again, a lot of great curiosity questions from, you know, how do we know what the correct color of a, a, a flame is all the way over to how do I start the boiler back up after we filled it with water correctly and, and what we should what that sound should sound like when we're at low water and a bunch of other great curiosity questions about what different types of fuels are more efficient and just on and on and on. We're getting a lot of great questions. And those questions, right, Gary, can be answered in the boiler class and really talking about in detail uh, about these things. Again, we can only learn so much about these things that people spend their whole careers on um, in this hour, but we hope we gave you an idea of, and hopefully a continued interest in this career path uh, for boilers. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Gary, for your wonderful, wonderful presentation. And you, you all have a great day. We look forward to hearing from you soon.